Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Empty Cloud Monastery. I'm very excited about this evening's topic. Uh, and this evening, we have with me to my right, Aya Soma, the wonderful, and to my left, Bhante J, the wow. also wonderful. Uh, and I'm Bhante Sudaso, the wonderful. unnotable. The wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and this evening, we'll be talking about teacher student relationships. Uh, so one of these important topics in Buddhist practice. Uh, so, uh, and you have a panel of three monks who can each make contributions on the topic. And also you're always welcome to put in questions related to the topic. Uh, and we'll be quite happy to address any questions you have on this topic of teacher-student relationships in Buddhism. So we'll start by paying homage to the Buddha. So the three of us will chant the traditional uh, homage to the Buddha, and then we'll get started. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami Okay, uh, so maybe I'll say a, a few opening words and um, then invite the two other monks to say some words as well. Uh, so first off, the topic of um, teacher-student relationships in Buddhism, uh, it needs to come back to the memory that ultimately we are all dependent upon the original teacher. Uh, so the original teacher in this era is Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, so the person who started life as um, Siddhartha Gautama and then at the age of 35, after many years of more well, spiritual practice, uh, he attained full awakening and he started teaching other people. He started teaching other people how to attain awakening as well. And during the Buddha's lifetime, he uh, guided thousands of people to full awakening. Uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and those people then taught their students and preserved the Buddhist teachings and uh, as an oral tradition, um, as well as as a, a lived experience of practicing and following the Dhamma. Uh, and that's been handed down for uh, over two and a half thousand years at this point. Uh, so the teacher-student relationship, it, it always comes back to this, this memory of the root teacher, the original teacher, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, and uh, recognizing that Shakyamuni Buddha was able to attain awakening without a teacher because he had cultivated the necessary conditions over hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes. Uh, so it's extraordinarily difficult to attain awakening uh, without a teacher. Technically possible, but extraordinarily difficult. It requires that one have extremely precise conditions developed over hundreds of lifetimes. So uh, the Buddha's first students were able to attain awakening very quickly because they both had good conditions from past lives. And more importantly, they had access to a teacher, uh, to a actually the best teacher. So a Samasam Buddha is the best teacher. Uh, and also they had the wonderful good conditions to be born in the time and place where they could access a Samasam Buddha. Uh, and then uh, each of us who's following afterwards, uh, again, recognizing that it's very difficult to attain awakening on our own, uh, we seek support from teachers. We seek support from people who can offer us instruction and assistance along the path. Um, and this is especially important in monastic life. Uh, so in monastic life, we, uh, for the first few years of uh, after ordination, we make a commitment to staying with a, a senior monk for um, pretty much all the time, uh, learning from them the basics of both Dhamma, uh, the Dhamma teachings of the Buddha, the 
mind training exercises and practices which lead towards awakening. Um, and also learning from them the vinya, so the principles of monastic code of conduct, the principles of monastic life, uh, of how to live a life of renunciation, uh, which is completely committed to Buddhist practice. And again, this is something which is quite difficult to figure out by oneself. Um, it's supported through uh, having a more experienced person who can help us out and, and give us pointers and, and guidance along the way. Uh, and having a teacher is also extraordinarily helpful for anyone, whether lay or monastic, uh, because a teacher, again, is it's usually going to be somebody who's more advanced than us in, in at least some areas of the path, and who therefore can help us figure out the next step, who can help us figure out how to uh, make progress. Uh, and teachers also tend to have uh, an external perspective uh, on our condition, uh, so it's often difficult to see our own blind spots, but our teachers are usually quite aware uh, of where our blind spots are. And if you have a compassionate teacher, then they will point out your faults to you. Uh, so this is one of the great benefits of a teacher is that they will tell you where your faults are and they will help you to correct those faults. So these are just a few opening words on the topic of teacher-student relationships. Maybe at this time, Ayasama, if you'd like to take over and say a few words. Thank you, Martin. Um, what comes to mind is actually um, the um, perhaps expectations that we have when we um, go forth or even when we actually are dedicated lay practitioners. So, um, and so there's very much a lot of focus on uh, uh, perhaps uh, meditation and uh, attainments in meditation. Um, but one of the suttas that I really love um, the most, the Salika Sutta, I feel like the Buddha actually pretty much addresses that and he's um, somewhat pointing, long story short, to the fact that Know, all the different jhanas or formless attainments, he, he defines them. Those are pleasant abidings in the discipline of the noble one. But the real, the true effacement <laughs> um, is essentially developing, um, yeah, all the, the noble eightfold path and uh, developing, you know, these qualities of minds, you know, other will be arrogant. We will not be arrogant. Other what, others will be difficult to be admonished. We will not be difficult to admonish be admonished and so forth. And so really putting the effort in actually creating those conditions where uh, those qualities of mind really shine. And uh, when we see uh, practitioners that are really well developed, and I'm thinking right now, oh, actually, Pante uh, um, Sudazo's preceptor is one of the most impressive beings that I've met, um, Ajahn Pasano. And he is just radiant in good con with good conduct. Um, radiant with so many incredible qualities of mind that are just constantly present there throughout the day, throughout um, all different sort of vicissitudes, is that English? Vicissitudini, vicissitudes? <laughs> yeah. um, through the day, uh, through the week perhaps, um, and yeah, those are incredible, that, 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 that strength, that fortitude of mind that comes with the practice. And uh, one of the incredible ways to develop that, obviously, in monastic life is actually the relationship that we um, take on uh, with our teacher, um, the relationship, the dependence that, for example, we, we take on. It's uh, something that I, I started noticing a lot to that, um, especially in the West, <laughs> <laughs> um, many people are kind of without even getting into the robes they're already like waiting to <laughs> get out of dependence <laughs> skipping it all together or like <laughs> their way out of this dependence I'm like wow you haven't even ordained you haven't even got into the dependence you're already like <laughs> trying to get out of it and it's very interesting because um uh Instead, it's a really great, <laughs> great place where to 
uh, really train the mind and, and wholesome qualities really train the mind and and actually what the Buddha is pointing out in the in the Salika Sutta. Um, so aside from, you know, obviously having a teacher that gives us pointers in our meditation practice, um, a teacher is also someone that we, you know, practice reverence and deference towards. Mm. Um, it's someone that we practice humility towards. Um, it's someone that, yeah, we just have the great opportunity of, creating um, room for those wholesome mind states to come into being. Um, so, yeah, we tend to think of, oh, when, am I, when is this like dependence? When is this Nisea going to be over? <laughs> or when am I going to be at the top of the, you know, of the Ajans, of, when I'm going to be the Ajan of the Ajans, so to speak. Um, but rather when we see, once again, developed practitioners, actually, they're always looking forward to someone who is um, more senior than them so that they actually can have these opportunities. So getting back to Ajan Pasanda, I think I spoke about it actually in the recent live stream, but it's never too mm -hmm. too much to actually talk about um, um, Ajahn Pasando, but yeah, when we want to visit with him, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, and Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is only one year senior to him, and I still remember how he was looking forward to pay respects to Ajahn Pasando, because these forms are really beautiful forms, are forms that um, are really supportive for the practice, so we need to, if we don't have a taste for them, and a lot of people who are born in Buddhist cultures, you know, they, they just have a taste to it, you know, no different than the fish sauce that uh, they use in, in Thailand. If we start eating it when we are maybe not born in the in that country and maybe we have developed our, a taste for maybe Italian food or maybe uh, Spanish food or maybe American food or maybe, you know, any kind of food but not um, Thai, we might go like, oh, this is strong taste. Um, uh, maybe we might have some aversion. And so it's the same thing with like, um, something that we're not raised in, um, all these forms that are part of Buddhist culture that are there to support us. In the very beginning, we're like, whoa, this is like, what is this bowing all about? What is this um, reverence and deference? A little bit too much, um, especially towards teachers. Like, uh, I mean, also that teacher doesn't seem that impressive altogether. So maybe <laughs> it's a little bit, a bit too much. If they were, you know, at least a John Cha, then maybe I could consider it. But <laughs> I don't like that teacher or that other teacher. We can get very hung up with all of our preferences and ideas. And, and we just don't have a taste, taste to it, which someone instead that is born in Buddhist culture usually is my experience that they're like, oh, this is great. Yeah, what a great opportunity to, to pay respects. Actually, there are more monastics here. Wonderful. So I get to bow to each one of them. How lovely, how great, how beautiful. And we see the beauty of that form, at least it's very evident to me, and the beauty of the wholesome mind states that the day people are producing. But conversely, when the same forms are, you know, hold, held in a sort of artificial way, in a difficult way, then it becomes a lot of big bunch of dukkha um, that we think that we're going to overcome uh, when we're finishing the dependence or when the um, meditation retreat is over, or when we're leaving the monastery or whatever it is that um, we're looking forward to. Um, <laughs> but rather, no, it's uh, it's dukkha that is constantly keeping in, uh, in our mind because we haven't given the opportunity to shave it all off. So, so yeah, this is what comes to mind in terms of teachers, um, really beautiful uh, relationships that we can, we have the opportunity to skillfully um, develop, you know? So the Buddha actually, when he had awakened, I remember something along the lines of him actually having this question. He's like, okay, now that I'm like the superior being in the world, who am I going to actually pay respects to? That's pretty terrible to live <laughs> without someone to, you know, pay respects to or to defer to or to take refuge in. And uh, the thought occurs into the mind of the Buddha. He's like, oh, actually, I'm going to take refuge in the Dhamma. I'm going to pay respects to the Dhamma. I'm going to, um, you know, yeah, defer to the Dhamma. But, you know, the fact that actually that thought is um, taken into consideration that the Buddha essentially is leading by example to uh, point us in the direction of this is not something to overlook. This is something to treasure. And even the most superior being actually has um, that 
um, as something to look forward to. Great, thank you. Um, and there's a few questions, so maybe we can invite Bhante Jay to say a few words and then we'll start going through the questions. Mm. So Bhante, if you'd like to say a few words on the topic. Mm. Well, I guess I, uh, I like to speak to, um, as I mentioned very briefly, there is a difference between, say, a, a lay person and a teacher and a monastic and a teacher. Um, th there are kind of different forms there. But I think that people who are kind of getting into Buddhism or are studying, different people have different proclivities towards what they're looking for. Right? I, I think uh, one of the misconceptions I had, like most like non-Buddhists have, we kind of think that we're going to be able to have like, um, like, uh, you know, like the Mr. Miyagi guru or some like teacher who's going to be there and like teach us very, you know, um, you know, all kinds of things or, or like, uh, what's the name from Kung Fu or something. We have these misconceptions and sometimes that's there. Sometimes that's not, but you know, we have, uh, there's a diversity of ways of deal of kind of relationship with, uh, teachers. In Buddhism, right? We have um, in Theravada, um, the, it's a bit mixed, but we, you, in Mahayana, you have things like, you know, the, the guru practice, where you kind of, you know, give yourself to the gurus, and they help you to kind of, um, to go forward with your practice. And, and uh, in Theravada, often, you don't necessarily have like one teacher who's a guru. Sometimes, uh, you know, you have, you um, a multitude of teachers and you learn from different people. Um, and I think different people have different tendencies towards which one is best for them. Um, and oftentimes, you know, when we are not in Buddhist countries and we have our limited options, um, I don't know. I think that's all I wanted to say. We can go to questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's important to keep in mind that what we're looking for in a teacher is not necessarily like an absolutely perfect, enlightened uber guru, um, but rather what we're looking for is someone who can help us move in the right direction. Uh, so one thing I found really helpful is the the Japanese word for teacher is a sensei, which literally means one step ahead. So the idea is that your teacher doesn't need to be fully awakened. They just need to be at least one step ahead of you. And then they'll have something to, to share. Uh, and also, as Ayasoma was pointing out, um, another major function of the teacher-student relationship is it helps one to cultivate um, humility and respectfulness. Uh, so it actually doesn't, your teacher doesn't necessarily need to be particularly remarkable. Uh, in order to be someone who you can use as a, a way to cultivate humility and respectfulness. Uh, in fact, it, it takes a certain extra effort to cultivate respect towards someone who's not that spectacular, which also then means that you get stronger results from that. Uh, like for me with, with my teacher, Ajahn Pasano, respect for him comes very naturally and easily because he's such a respectable person. Um, but with other other monks, not so much. Uh, one has to put in a, a more deliberate effort to cultivate a sense of respect. So uh, there's a few questions here, so we can take some of these questions. So Jay Kala asks, do you have any thoughts on how appropriate it is to share resources with people wanting to learn from teachers with a somewhat mixed set of helpful teachings and strange views? There are some popular teachers who tend to be very helpful to some and have helpful teachings, but who also have some seemingly wrong views around topics such as Nibbana. In my opinion, it's better to direct them to teachers who are helpful and do not have strange views. So there's actually lots and lots and lots of wonderful monks, uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis these days who are pretty orthodox, very helpful, and have tons of material available, uh, especially on the internet, uh, like tons of Dhamma talks, tons of 
articles, uh, also books, which you can get for free or access easily enough. So there's plenty of teachers available who have plenty of resources available and who do not have strange views. So I don't really see the point in directing people to the, the people with a mixture of helpful and, and harmful viewpoints. Um, I mean, uh, I guess you could warn the person ahead of time that there's some good things and some bad things about this teacher. But even then you're setting up the conditions for, for the person to get misled and, and for them to wind up going down a wrong path or for them to, to take on the wrong views. So I don't, honestly, I don't personally think it's, it's a really good idea. Um, uh, I think it's, it's better to stick to teachers who you, you don't believe are, are harboring wrong view, in my opinion. I, I do think this kind of does bring up an interesting topic though, when dealing with teachers, right? Um, as you get to know a teacher, you will, you will see that like, as Bonte says, they're not perfect. Right. And oftentimes this kind of shattering, um, of this idealistic view of your, uh, of a teacher, um, can be a very distraught thing for people. Um, and they can lose a lot of faith and things like that. But one of the things that I've learned for myself is that whoever I've kind of observed, I've taken what was good and I left the rest, mm -hmm. right? Because and also honestly, there's been many monks where I learned what not to do, right? So so <laughs> so it was a good thing, right? Either way, um, so it, it's important to kind of understand that, right? You know, uh, I kind of agree with Bonte. If the, if you know somebody is a bit you know, um, wrong viewy, um, <laughs> it's probably best to just avoid them. Uh, but you know, e even somebody who's a well-respected, you know, high monk and, you know, you get to know them and, um, over time and you, you just see that they're not perfect. They're not awakened. And, and so you take what's good and you leave the rest. I think it also depends upon the severity of the wrong view. If it's just like, someone has a particular interpretation of some controversial doctrinal point and uh, that's a little bit unusual. It's like, well, that's probably not such a big deal. You can just tell the person like, this person's a great teacher, but they have some kind of odd opinions about Patita Samupada, which are not common. Um, that's fine. Um, but if the person is saying things like, there's no such thing as rebirth, uh, there's no such thing as karma, there's no heaven, no hell, no devas, then, then yeah, just no, just no. Yeah, just don't, eat, no. Thoughts? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I mean, that's the definition of wrong, wrong view, so. It is, in fact, the main way the Buddha defines wrong view. Uh, rejecting karma and rebirth is basically the textbook definition of wrong view. So Manal asks, uh, how would exactly one go about seeking such a kind, compassionate teacher in today's time? How would that relationship look like? Visit some monasteries. That's what I would recommend. And that relationship will look like whatever it winds up looking like. But br br briefly speaking, the more committed you are uh, to learning, then usually the more interested the teacher will be in teaching. Um, if a student is resistant, then most teachers aren't even going to bother. Um, but if a student is very willing to learn and very eager to learn and very eager to be trained. So keeping in mind that the teacher-student relationship in Buddhism is, it's not so much like a university class where like the professor is delivering a body of intellectual knowledge. It's more like dog training. <laughs> so there's a lovely story from Ajahn Chah. So Ajahn Chah started to collect um, a lot of Western disciples who didn't really speak any Thai. And so people uh, asked Ajahn Chah, like, how are you able to teach Buddhism to these Westerners who don't share a common language with you. Uh, and Ajahn Chah said, well, it's easy. It's the same way you train a buffalo. 
Okay, apparently that joke is, is funnier <laughs> in my mind. I'm, oh, I'm laughing. My yeah. Like, <laughs> so I, I think it I think it works better in old agricultural societies where <laughs> people had these like big lumbering stupid draft animals and they had to like hit them with sticks to get them to go in the right direction. So that's the context. It's kind of like People are like, how do you train these people? And he's like, oh, you train them the same way you, you train your draft animals. We don't have sticks that I'm thinking of. <laughs> and and oh. as the Buddha says, if they can't be trained, he kills them. <laughs> uh, these are all metaphors. <laughs> disclaimer. Well, in Japanese <laughs> and also Chinese, actually in East Asian monasteries, the stick is not a metaphor. It's it's quite real. Yeah. Um, yeah unfortunately, we don't we don't use that in Theravada. Um, Okay. <laughs> this can be easily misinterpreted. Yes. But actually, maybe Bhante, do you want to address the then he kills them? Oh, since yeah. uh... <laughs> No, I think the, 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 the mystery is better. <laughs> no, it's, it's a sutta where the Buddha is speaking to a person who trains thoroughbred horses. And there's a comparison of like, you know, what you do like the like the thoroughbred horse uh, person who's training the horseman and and how he trains the horse and how the buddha trains the disciple and then the the, the buddha says well what if they cannot be trained and they're totally wild and the, the horseman says well we killed them and then the buddha says well i also killed them and what that means is he just refuses to train them he he just he stops training them that's what that means yeah, so the absolute worst thing that can happen to you in the buddhist world is when the teacher refuses to train you um, and usually they are doing that because at that point you've clearly demonstrated that you're too stubborn, you're too resistant. And I just wanted to add something with uh, to Manal's question um, that I don't know if also she's they're talking about in, in terms of a layperson um, finding a teacher and what that relationship would look like. I would still want to highlight the trust element and mm -hmm. also the looking at the sila of how mm -hmm. sila is held um, both by the individual and the community that one goes to so it's very important uh, especially because in some lineages um, where they're not perhaps Vinaya lineages. So perhaps the monastics look like monastics, but they're actually not even monastics, or sometimes they are monastics, but they have different precepts than the, you know, the, the ones that um, have been, you know, the precepts that have been established by the Buddha, then there can be, unfortunately, some cases where people that don't have impeccable um, morality might might slip <laughs> here and there. And then um, there are some unfortunate stories of uh, coercion or our, you know, misconduct of different sorts where we have to be really, really careful not to fall into that kind of predicament. Um, so always, you know, checking, doing a little bit of a background check of the organization, the monastery, the community that one is um, is going to is always a good idea just to make sure that there are no crazy scandals that have been happening in that lineage for, for some time and that we won't find ourselves in a in an unhappy, unfortunate situation. Um, and yeah, make sure not to put all your faith in only one individual. Mm -hmm. Um, but rather to take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. So that's what we take refuge in, in the uh, Triple Gem. And if even someone that we perceive as extremely remarkable then makes bad choices, then our faith won't be shaken by it because we have put our faith in the Triple Gem rather than in one single individual. Yeah, it's good to remember that the more a uh, practitioner's wisdom grows, then the stronger their morality becomes. So watch the morality of a teacher. 
Um, if their morality is shaky, then that's not a sign of advanced wisdom. It's actually a sign of the exact opposite. Um, so a good teacher is someone who has impeccable morality. And Sud asks, I'm confused as to what does a teacher usually do? I understand if you're in a monastery, they can teach meditation, but most lay people don't live in monasteries. Well, keeping in mind that the teacher-student relationship is something that's co-created. So it also, what the teacher does also depends to a large degree on what the student is, is up for. So for example, if a lay person goes to the monastery once a week or once a month or something, then there can be developed a, a certain relationship with the teacher and the teacher can start to get to know the person to the point where they can offer some useful advice. Um, but in that context, it's mostly going to come down to the, the lay person asking particular questions uh, related to how to apply the Dhamma to their life situation, how to apply the Dhamma to um, their relationships, how to apply the Dhamma to their everyday life, and also how to uh, improve their meditation practice. Um, so a lot of it, uh, when you do have a very limited amount of time that you are around a teacher, then uh, a lot of the weight comes on the student to put forward um, questions for the teacher, to give the teacher enough information that the teacher is able to help. Um, it's a bit easier when living in monasteries because you get to observe people 24 seven. So it's much easier to be able to see how to help the student. Um, when someone's coming once in a while, then it's necessary for the student to be more forthcoming and, and clear about what their difficulties are and what they need help with. And Don Reef, this is a little bit off topic. Should we take it anyway? This one? Well, it has to do somewhat tangentially. Don asks, do I have to be Buddhist to come meditate and learn about Buddha? No. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah, I mean, when I, I lived at Bhavana Society for five and a half years, I I led and taught in probably somewhere around 60 retreats, and most of the people, of the thousands of people I spoke to were not Buddhist. Right? There's especially in places like in America and you know non-Buddhist countries, a lot of people are um, coming to Buddhist places for a variety of different reasons. Right? Maybe they're fully on the path. Maybe they want to, you know, kind of, enhance their Christianity with Buddhism, or maybe they want to be a secular Buddhist, who knows? There's a lot of different paths. Um, and so, yeah, no, if you want to learn, then, well, you're, uh, you're on here, right? This is a good a step. You're, you're here um, with three monastics online. Go to places, learn what you will, and, you know, use that information um, in whatever path you're on and how you see fit. And Kumu asks, would a monk learn from a lay person who is well-versed in the Dhamma? Say a technique of meditation, Goenka meditation retreats come to my mind. Um, <laughs> um, in principle, yes. In practicality, I seem not to. Um, in the way that I can't find more the well versed in the Dhamma um, in the West, anyway. So, so far, I haven't really found anyone who was well versed in the Dhamma that was a lay person, which is why actually I started a Buddhist organization that connected people with monastics because I was a lay person and I wanted to be in touch with the monastic. So, so as a lay person, uh, <laughs> I would not really want to learn from a lay person. Did I want to work, uh, learn from a lay person first in the Dhamma? There was something, um, whenever I was going to lay centers and learning from teachers, there was a lot of theory, but very little practice to something that seems to me really needs to be coming from the other way around. 
Um, so when I was a lay person, I used to commute actually every Saturday to Chongyan Monastery where Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi lives. So it was four hours one way, four hours back. <laughs> Do it every Saturday. So eight hours of commute for uh, four hours of Dhamma. <laughs> it's a great trade-off for me. <laughs> um, just to yeah, learn from a monastic who I trusted. So in principle, I would say yes, actually, about the Sutta. So this morning gave a um, beautiful Dhamma talk on uh, the Uga Sutta, which is one of my favorite suttas. And um, Uga also was, um, you know, non, non-returner. So actually, if there were, probably in Asia, I probably would. Actually, even in the West, I have many um, lay people that are born Buddhist that, that I defined as my teachers as well, literally. <laughs> But not necessarily as Dhamma teachers in the sense of what we think of Dhamma teachers. So nobody like sits down and like, okay, I guess I'll let me explain to you um, dependent origination. But rather it's, um, yeah, all our Thai friends um, always teach me so many different ways of embodying the Dhamma. Um, of, they lead by example rather than, than giving me Dhamma talks. It's more, I see a Dhamma talk in action. <laughs> and in that way, I, I feel like they're my teachers. In terms of a technique of meditation, um, I haven't done Guanta retreats, um, but even there, I'm a little bit diffident, um, but I'm open to it. I'm diffident, but I'm a little bit open to it. I just feel like if someone is really realized, then they would probably be a monastic. So I'm mm. kind of like a little bit <laughs> like what's what's going on yeah and just to say a little bit since i i have gone to a going career retreat um the meditation method that's taught there um they cloak it in a lot of secrecy but it's actually just a completely bog standard ordinary meditation technique that virtually any meditator monk knows about and might actually know um and also the level of detail to which it's taught is, is pretty superficial. It's not particularly deep or profound. So honestly, if you want to learn the Goenka method, go to a monk. Don't go to a Goenka retreat. Goenka retreats are great because they're extremely well-structured and organized meditation retreats. But in terms of quality of instruction, uh, you'll still get much higher quality of instruction from experienced monks than, than you will at a Goenka retreat. The meditation method there is, it's nothing special. It's nothing unique. It's nothing rare. It's its completely standard, common, ordinary. Um, okay. And Rick says, as a lay person, how can we know how far to trust a teacher when we don't have an in-depth understanding of the suttas? I have witnessed several people being led astray. Uh, you can't. You can't trust a teacher, right? The Buddha says very clearly, the only way you can know the quality of somebody is by living with them for a long time and seeing how they react to certain things, right? So this is why I always say, like even in my own community, I, I harp on never giving your agency to one person, right? Your agency means like you're like your thinking and your your questioning and your investigation. Um, you know, if you're kind of giving all that over to one person, then you're setting yourself up for suffering, right? This is um, something that's a danger. So how how can we know how far to trust a teacher? Well, th this is what I say. The only monastics that I trust fully had Parinibbana 2,600 years ago. <laughs> Mahamogalana, Sariputta, Mahakasapa, right? Patachara, uh, you know, these, these uh, beings. So again, as I kind of said before, when I listen to the teachings of a, of a monastic and, and then I, you know, or teacher, whoever, and I'll listen to the teachings and, and I'll see, well, is this, is this, you know, connecting? Is this, does, 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 especially now, you know, these days, now that I'm pretty firm in exactly what I'm studying and practicing, um, I judge anybody I hear from you know, the text, the early text. But um, what I would say is, you know, it's kind of like dipping your toe into the water, 
right? You're just listening, seeing what you can learn. And, and then if that is beneficial, well, then learn more, practice more, go, go to the place. But always with just that kind of, you know, you don't have to be paranoid about it. You don't have to be like worried about it. That's, that's not really the best way to be able to learn. Um, but never kind of just giving over your agency without real any, you know, any questions, any thoughts, these kind of things. Um, yeah, it, it's, I, I feel like I, in many ways, I don't have a lot to say about this because, and I, I don't know how common my experience is, but I've never had just one teacher. I've kind of had like a series in a way that, that, that Zen thing was like when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Like I, I've had like monastics like come into my life, either some of them I've never met. Some of them are just online. Some, most of them I've met, obviously, but they've come into my life and they've been impactful for a certain period. And then they just kind of fade. And Ajahn Brahm was big for me for years, but now he's, you know, he's not really that, you know, big in, in terms of my practice these days, but he was there. He, his, his teachings were important at the time. And then I met Bhante G and I was with Bhante G for basically, you know, I lived with him for five and a half and I was visiting for three years before that. So eight years. And, and now, you know, Bhante G is uh, the time for Bhante G is past. And then, so it's just for me, it's this kind of um, learning from the, you know, the people who come into my life at the right time and exactly what I need, right? Being open for that. Um, and then when that time is passed, when, you know, when the time for the teacher is passed, then just being able to let that go. So, you know, you know obviously the, the, as Bonte was saying in the beginning, right, the idea is that you want somebody who is going to understand and be further along the path than you, right? Um, so that person is by, by um, you know, just by that, they're always going to be more advanced. And, and so you're always going to have to make sure that you um, dip your toe in the water and go in very slowly because, you know, you don't know necessarily what you're going to get. And, and even if this person is somebody who is, um, you know, that you've known for, you know, that everybody says they're really good for many, many years. And that's OK. Well, you know, as the Buddha says, neither neither accept nor deny and just test it out for yourself right? and, and see, but always make sure that you have, keep your agency with you. Um, you know, don't give your, don't give everything up um, and take what you can get and leave the rest. I'd also add a, a couple of things to that. Um, well, first off, you say you don't have an in-depth understanding of the suttas. Well, get an in-depth understanding of the suttas, read the suttas cover to cover. I say this over and over and over and over and over again. I'm really not kidding. Read all the suttas cover to cover. It helps tremendously. Then you'll hear so-and-so rambling on and on, and you'll be like, oh, that person is directly contradicting what the Buddha said. Therefore, I'm not going to pay much attention to that particular person. And then you'll be like, however, um, this person over here is very much in line with what the Buddha said. So maybe maybe they've got a better grasp of things. Um, in the meantime, I would also point you to the Gotami Sutta. So the Buddha gives eight basic standards for judging whether or not something is the real Dhamma. Um, so look up the Gotami Sutta, where the Buddha gives eight guidelines. He says, if it leads to um, relinquishment rather than to accumulation, uh, and and so on. There's eight of them. I won't give an explanation now, or we'll be here all night. I should get a sutta su su study on it one of these days. It's a great sutta. Great idea. Yes, next week. Um, oh no, you won't be here. Oh, following, following week. One. Okay. Um, anything else on this, or should we keep going? No, so okay. it's good. And S. Jeff says, especially in this one-way internet age, can we call someone teacher who doesn't know us from who? Maybe that's a typo. Either that or it's a word I don't know. Does the relationship need to be two-way? I think he, they're saying who doesn't know us in person. Huh. So, well, I would say that it really depends on what is your definition of a teacher. 
Um, and actually, this also counts for um, in person, like even if you actually meet um, quote unquote teacher in person. Um, so similarly to Bate J and actually also Bate Sudaso, um, I also like to have many teachers. And not necessarily each teacher has covers the same role um, in my life. So there are actually, for example, certain um, Syrian monastics that I really love their Dhamma, Dhamma talks, their their actual Dhamma teachings. Um, but if I ask them a, a question, there is, I just don't have the karmic conditions to connect with them. So either they don't really understand the question that I'm, <laughs> that I'm asking sometimes, or um, maybe they just can't relate to me in, a, in understanding where I'm coming from. Um, so then it's more of a kind of one way relationship and it's still great. I learned so much um, and they're still like very present in my life, uh, sometimes online, sometimes in person if they're visiting uh, or if I visit them. Um, and it's a wonderful relationship that I would not want uh, for it to disappear. And then there are other um, figures, other teachers where instead if I have um either a personal issue, something, you know, that I don't know how to solve in lines with Dhamma um, that then I can bring up to them and they understand everything <laughs> about my mind um, and about the Dhamma. And it's kind of like a win-win situation. So they are capable of um, of guiding me in the, in the right direction. Um, or maybe they just understand me and they are capable of uh, guiding me in the, in the right direction. And then there are some others that actually I do not like their Dhamma talks and <laughs> they also don't connect with me as a person. But if I give myself the opportunity to actually be there and listen, um, those have been in the past actually uh, through our organization mm, that I was like, wow, so very interesting. When we allow ourselves to be open to also either monastics or or people that you know we might have due to past karmic conditions, like a sort of repulsion towards either what they're saying or how they're behaving, etc. But if we kind of like are able to put that on the side for a while and yeah, we might learn a few things. And actually some of the precious teachings I've learned in those, um, in those occasions, um, like for example, I deepened my understanding of karma, I remember, in, in one of those occasions with a monastic that I wasn't really connecting at all. So to get back to your question, um, can you call someone a teacher who doesn't know you? Um, can it be, does the relationship need to be two-way? It only needs to be two-way when you are actually in Nisaya, in my, in my opinion, when you actually you know, are a monastic and you take the penance. Um, otherwise there's different different ways um, to, to have different relationships. Yeah, I think that would be mm -hmm. my answer. Could, could I just briefly? Yes, please. Uh, I wanted to put it. So one of the things that when you read the suttas, you, you see that like th there was really no such thing back then as like, oh, this is my one teacher. Well, what you saw was the monastics were like always wandering, mm -hmm. right? And the villagers would have kind of like a steady like, incoming of various monastics right so monastics would come and then they would learn from them and then those monastics would go and then not more monastics would come right and then maybe we had oh the buddha's going the buddha's going to be there let's go there right so it was this kind of and it's very similar to like ajahn moon ajahn cha like the thai forest time where there were like you know all these wandering monastics going from village to village um and hearing about the teacher oh we're going to go you know here but so it, it's, that's kind of how it is. Like if you're like, you know, there's no monastery, no, nothing near you and it's just online. That's, it's basically that way. It's kind of like, well, you're at your desk, you know, or whatever. And let's see which monastic teaching arises. You know, what, what monk has come into the village that I can learn from. Um, so, you know, so it's very important that it, it's, 
I don't think that it should be like feel felt like a requirement that you absolutely have to go search to the ends of the earth for one teacher that and you go live with them and they're going to be your teacher forever. No, you know, even in the early days, that's not how it was. So learn. Right. And somebody who, you know, uh, one one monastic who I only met for two days once, Bhante Dhammajiva, who at my first retreat. And he taught me walking meditation, changed my life. And I only met him for two days, right? And one of these days when I go to Sri Lanka, I want to go pay respects to him as a monastic because I wouldn't be a monastic without him. Same with Ajahn Brahm, who I already thanked years ago because um, I was able to see him. But, you know, yeah, if somebody is um, whose teachings are out there uh, and you can learn from them, then that's fine. You know, you don't, and, and some, maybe they even have a live stream where you can ask them questions. That's a good thing, right? More since COVID more and more monastics do do that. So there's a lot of opportunity now. Yeah. Often people use the word teacher more to mean the person whose teachings have had the strongest ongoing impact on them. Um, and I think that's a fair enough use of the word, as long as one is clear that that's what one means by the word. Um, and Jay Lyles asked, does the teacher have any responsibility for the safety of their students? How should a teacher act if their instructions lead to harm in a student? So ultimately in Buddhism, the, a teacher is acting with the intent to bring benefit to uh, anyone who receives the teachings. So, and ultimately it's to help people make progress towards awakening. So if a sincere teacher realizes that their method of instruction has been causing harm, then they will make an effort to understand how to teach in a way which does not cause harm. Um, so that's briefly my thoughts on the matter. Okay, clear enough? Mm -hmm. Richard asks, what are the key characteristics of a good student and what level of preparation would be sufficient before embarking on the search for the appropriate teacher? Willingness to be admonished. Yes. Yeah, and a willingness to change your behavior. So Buddhism is not just about collecting information. It's about making radical lifestyle changes. So if you're not willing to make radical lifestyle changes, then you will not make swift progress if you make any progress at all. Yes, as a matter of fact, actually, it's highly recommended to, um, as soon as you go to a place, if that is your intention, to ask, this is what I would always do, and I still do. Whenever I go to a monastery, I always ask, please um, admonish me, uh, share your admonishment. If, if I do anything wrong with body, speech, and mind, and uh, by creating that opening, then the monastics there will be ready to give you some pointers. And that's how I learned a lot of things um, in, the, in the past years when I was going to monasteries, then COVID shut it down. <laughs> but also here actually with uh, my venerable um, brothers, um, that's how we started the Vasa actually. Uh, we all um, requested each other to admonish the other. And Amaranta says, I've been practicing for years in a group and I've learned a lot, but my heart and mind were always hesitating because the unwholesome actions in the past of the founder. Um, I found Theravada here online and I feel much better, but there are friends in the group and take retreats and courses there. That's my situation. Personally, I have to say that if a group was founded by somebody with a history of repeated ongoing serious violations of morality then i would stay as far away from that group as possible um, even if there is good dhamma teachings in there the fact that it was tainted from the very beginning and was tainted throughout much of its history that makes me very hesitant um, so um, there's a couple organizations that come to mind i'm not going to name names right at this moment. Um, but there's a couple organizations which I wouldn't get anywhere near them because I know what their founder did. And I know that their founder was completely unrepentant about what they did for years and years and years and years. Um, so I wouldn't get anywhere near them personally. So I, if I was in your situation, I would be grateful for the good lessons that you learned. 
and I would turn my back and move on. Uh, try to find a more pure organization with a firm commitment to morality. Okay. That's, yeah. And Faze, Faze says, how is education in Deva realm? Is that close to human way of teaching and learning or totally different? I don't know. I don't no. remember anymore. <laughs> the Deva realm thing is interesting because uh, on the one hand, the Buddha explains that the Deva realms as being exclusively pleasurable. But on the other hand, Devas do come and learn. So I think maybe it depends on the level of Deva. Maybe if the Devas that are closer to the earth are, will, will, will come here, Dhamma, but the other ones higher will just bliss out and pleasure all the time. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And Sud asks, are male and female monks at Empty Cloud Monastery able to take on students? Depends on what you mean by taking on students. Mm -hmm. But if you want to <laughs> learn and you have a sincere willingness to learn, a willingness to relinquish wrong view um, and a willingness to change um, improper conduct, then that's why Buddhist monasteries exist. We exist in order to help people straighten out their views and correct their conduct. That's why we exist. So Empty Cloud is not different in that way. We're the same as most Buddhist monasteries. That's the purpose of our being. And Rick asks, in the West, is it common for people to turn to monastics for help with mental and emotional problems? Or is it more common for them to be inspired to learn and practice the Dhamma? I don't understand the question. Is it common for people to turn to monastics for help with mental and emotional problems? Is it more common for the people to be inspired to learn and practice the Dhamma? I think he's asking, like, do people come here as a replacement for psychotherapy or do they come here purely for learning Dhamma? I hope the latter, uh, since we're not mental health um, trained professionals, uh, but there are tons of mental health trained professionals. So yeah, it just happens that then learning and practicing the Dhamma also helps dealing with mental and emotional problems. But if that's the main issue that one is experiencing in their life, it's good that they go to a mental health um, practitioner first and that they can also direct them on how to how get some support with the Dhamma as well. Hmm. I, I would just add that I, I do believe that Buddhism in the West does see probably more than its fair share of people with mental health issues. Um, I think there's a variety of reasons. I think um, one of the big reasons is that Buddhism has a kind of Buddhism has a kind of uh, reputation for basically being accept uh, accepting of everybody, right? And so, like maybe they've kind of like burned bridges in different religions at different places, but they're like, oh, the Buddhists will accept me, right? And they come and. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, in, in my, you know, now seven or so years of being in monasteries, it's, it's very common now. And I think, but I, what I think is that um, they're looking for any people with, with mental health or not mental health, what they're looking for is what we're all looking for, right? They're looking for um, a way to end their suffering. Right. And so, you know, and I think, again, when people look to Buddhism, they think, oh, well, that, well that's what Buddhism is for. Right. They all these Buddhists are always talking about suffering. <laughs> so maybe they know something about it. Right. And, and and so, and yeah, sometimes maybe they want to replace meditation with meditation uh, or meditation <laughs> with medication. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and that has happened. I mean, people have tried to get me to validate them going off their meds so, and just meditating. Uh, but mostly it's just, you know, people, people searching, right? People looking for, um, you know, people looking for a path, right? People looking for a way to kind of get out of their sufferings. I mean, to a certain degree, we all have mental and emotional problems. Otherwise, we would be enlightened, you know? Yeah, so, <laughs> but I guess it's 
you know, if you depending from your phrasing, I took it to to mean in to mean in a particular a particular mm -hmm. goal. Um, but yeah, we all suffer, and of course, the Dhamma leads us um, to the cessation of suffering. But it's important that there's a kind of fine line, um, as Banteje, I think, was kind of um, aiming at. Um, yeah, it's not some kind of like free therapy or <laughs> some right. discounted to, to today special only. <laughs> <laughs> like $99 instead of <laughs> whatever it is. So yeah, if one has that intention, then actually probably it will do more damage than good. But if instead one understands the purpose of the Dhamma, understands the goal of the Dhamma and comes here for the right intention, then yeah, will be very good, very good. Okay. And Jay Lyle says, how much latitude do bhikkhus in your sangha have in directing their practice? Would only following the suttas and disregarding the Abhidhamma and Visuddhimagga be allowed? I think that describes all three of us. I don't think any of us has much interest in the Abhidhamma and the Visuddhimagga. Well, Empty Cloud Monastery has a focus on early Buddhism, this being said, to define what early Buddhism exactly is, um, well, it takes quite a long time. So I won't get into that right now. So I would say that one can disregard the Abhidhamma and Zudimaga in their practice, but I think it's still not good to disregard it as altogether in terms of like um, developing a conceit of superiority or saying, okay, well, that's only this is true. Everything else is wrong. Um, and also definitely respecting other um, practitioners or monastics for, for whom that instead is their, is their practice, is their goal. Hmm. And someone did I I was just, I think, as you said, if someone's interested in the Abhidhamma and is talking about the role of a student and a teacher, they would seek out somebody that has an interest. Mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, if someone, you go to a place where they have a similar interest as you, so you can yeah. like most people like. Yeah, I mean, here, as I some was saying, here we put a lot of emphasis on the suttas, uh, so the early teachings of the Buddha. So if somebody's interested in Abhidhamma and Vasudhimagga, they should go to a monastery which puts emphasis on Abhidhamma and Vasudhimagga. So if someone comes here and they're like, I want to learn Abhidhamma and Vasudhimagga, well, then I would actually tell them, like, this isn't really the best place for that. Like, you're, you'd be better off going to a monastery where that's the focus. Um, so um, latitude in directing their practice It's more like, are you actually in a place where you feel supported and practicing in the way that you feel is best for you? So if somebody came here who was like a diehard Vasudhi Magga purist, they might feel actually quite uncomfortable because I'm I'm not. I don't think any of us are, are really big into the Vasudhi Magga. So. But actually, I mean, we're also not disrespectful of people who who have particular so we're also a non-sectarian monastery so the focus of the monastery is early buddhism but we're also non-sectarian so there are monastics who have different focuses who come here from time mm. to time and it's not necessarily that we impose one particular practice on one particular emphasis to to anyone and actually there is much growth to be had um, in diversity in all sorts of different different ways. So actually, it's a great learning opportunity in one way or the other. Of course, if you're not interested in the Abhidhamma and Visuddhi Magga, it'll be like a drop in the water here at Empty Cloud Monastery, but <laughs> um, not necessarily one wants to, one might want that. I've actually found that most Western monks are not much interested in Abhidhamma and Visuddhi Magga. There's a few who are. It's because we don't yeah. hang out with a lot of Burmese monastics, Bonte. That is true. <laughs> yeah. So Allison says, I just came back from a Goenka retreat and saw a number of discrepancies from the Buddhist teachings, but appreciated the focus the method provided. Thank you for saying it's at least a start. 
Perhaps I could follow up with questions. Yes, tomorrow evening at Monk Chat, you can bring questions. Um, so um, the Sangha panel has a focus topic and then Monk Chat is completely open. So you can bring all your questions about going to practice to the Monk Chat tomorrow. Joe asks, what are your thoughts on lay teachers who use students' generosity as a means of livelihood? Honestly, okay. And I, <laughs> honestly, I, I don't have much thoughts in general about lay teachers because I don't really think about lay teachers. So I, th I think that's fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as, actually, especially if it's students' generosity. Um, so, yeah, if people are supporting a teacher, whether they're lay or monastic, I think it's in accordance with Dhamma. Um, free will generosity, that's beautiful. And that's actually the last question from online. Um, any questions from the monastery residents on this topic, teacher-student relationships? Yeah. Are there any instances where devas teach humans? Is this like a thing? There are a very small number of suttas where devas come um, and give usually brief instructions to monks who are struggling in their practice. Um, it's not particularly common, but there are a handful of cases like that. I yeah. love them actually in the uh, yeah. Samyutta Nikaya. Like, like, uh, like, angels, spirits, yeah. celestial beings. But, yeah. You're talking about when they admonish them when yes. the monks are being bad or like, they're, yeah. they're not really, I guess <laughs> technically that's a teaching, but it's not, they're not oh, like, that's teaching. Yeah. Yeah. That's teaching, <laughs> they're great teachings actually. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. also, a bunch of shaming actually or like the lazy bhikkhu i love it because in the so you think i have you know the bhikkhunis are all like in light fully enlightened so they're all like there and mana comes and tempts them and they're like talk to my hand and then the bhikkhus are there slacking off sleeping and the devas go and they're like what are you doing you should be ashamed of yourself they're some of my favorite suttas, but they actually um, shared the Dhamma with them. So I think that qualifies as teaching. Yeah. Rick says, for those of us without access to a local teacher or Sangha, is there a way to get occasional guidance from a teacher on our personal meditation practice when the questions are not appropriate to share openly online? Okay. I would question your assumption that you can't share them openly online. So, uh, for example, I remember Ajahn Pasano, he lived with Ajahn Shah for many years, and he said it was almost impossible to ask a private question to Ajahn Shah. He was never alone. So people would ask questions in front of groups of 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 people, because that was their only opportunity to ask questions. Um, it was nearly impossible to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ajahn Chah. So people would ask questions about the most embarrassing things. Uh, so questions about sexuality, uh, questions about defilements, questions about uh, wrong view. They would ask it publicly in front of groups of other people because learning the Dhamma was more important than avoiding embarrassment. So I would question this idea that you have to ask meditation questions in private. I don't, I don't believe that's true. If you have questions, then ask them. Uh, if otherwise, you might not get an answer. I think it's better to ask publicly and get an answer than to wait for the right moment, which never comes. Those are my thoughts anyway. Um, that said, there, there probably are some monks who, um, answer questions online. Um, if I answered every question that came to my inbox, I would be doing literally nothing else with my time. Um, I would be spending all my time answering uh, questions. Uh, so it's, it's a lot. Um, so yeah, I think it's better just ask them publicly online uh, and accept the fact that privacy is an illusion. Those are my thoughts anyway.
And yeah, I, I was going to mention the, of emailing uh, a monastic, but as you as you say, even even those of us who are not big famous monastics, that can really go overboard real quickly. <laughs> People emailing with all kinds of stuff, even like paragraphs and paragraphs, and it's like, okay, I think I'm going to take a week to respond to this thing. <laughs> so yeah, but. Uh, Get a question? Marlon? Yeah. Um, hopefully I don't get admonished for this question. <laughs> but um, considering the Buddha became enlightened without a teacher, from my understanding, mm -hmm. and I, um, I'm aware of, you know, enlightened beings that have also, you know, became enlightened without formal teaching, usually through, you know, major suffering, spontaneous awakening. What do you have... What can we say about that um, in regards to the, uh, the necessity of having a teacher? Well, I would say that in uh, anybody who attains awakening in the last 2,500 years, they have had some influence from the fact that Shakyamuni Buddha was here. So even if they didn't have a formal relationship with an officially Buddhist teacher, they've had some kind of contact with the Dhamma because it's been part of human culture for 2,500 years. So the Buddha's teachings saturated India to the point where it's just worked into the culture in ways which aren't even necessarily immediately identifiable as being Buddhist, but it's just worked into the culture. Um, it saturated East Asia uh, it even penetrated as, as far west as Iraq, uh, and this is 2,000 years ago. Uh, and similarly, as cultural exchange happened, the teachings of the Buddha have reached literally everywhere in the world. Uh, in the last few hundred years, there's been literally nowhere in the world that hasn't felt the touch of Buddhism. Um, so I would say if somebody has a spontaneous awakening, it's not easy to say that they did so without influence from Shakyamuni Buddha. And that's without even getting into the metaphysical, because I also think there's a metaphysical component here, um, that when a Buddha awakens in a world that leaves a mark, which lasts for thousands of years, you know, almost like something in the air. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that there's obviously past karma that we have done so it's not that even actually in what might seem like a spontaneous awakening um we're just seeing a fragment of the story so from the buddhist perspective since uh we don't only live once but we live multiple times without discoverable beginning <laughs> there's um lots of past karma that we have done in the past so it's just that we don't know what we have done and um, what we can do and we, what we should do is focus on what we have available right now. Um, and what we should always be seeking is learning from someone. And actually, I would say it's not quite 100% accurate to say that the Buddha didn't have a teacher um, in the way that he didn't. He was self-taught in terms of full enlightenment, but actually in the life of the, the Buddha, he actually learned from, he had many different teachers and he mastered all their teachings. But then he went further and then um, eliminated entirely suffering. But he had, yeah, all the, if you see the life of the Buddha, um, he learned um, lots of different meditation techniques from many different, uh, all the masters basically of the time, um, and then went further. So if we get into the realms of speculation of what we have done in the past and what is our level of attainment now in terms of, um, not it, Meditation, meditative attainments, etc., but rather level of attainment in terms of good karma that will lead to awakening. It's all in the realms of speculation, and actually, we could be very easily deluded and fall in into the trap of arrogance and over evaluation. Which actually, having run this organization for seven years, it's very common. <laughs> we always get it on a regular basis, um, like people who have extreme delusion and in their experience like they really believe that 
they really like it's obvious to them um just as it's obvious to us multiple people outside are going like wow that person is really deluded <laughs> and they're doing exactly the same thing that the other deluded person uh, was doing before so we always want to think of ourselves as being deluded being that deluded person so not even having a con conceit of superiority when we see other deluded people but rather go whoa that could be me mm. so that's also the important thing of actually seeking people who are who take that kind of figure um, as teacher is so that it creates those conditions for us to humble the mind um, to yeah eliminate arrogance which is a hindrance um, and to doubt you know, in ourselves, <laughs> our idea of what even enlightenment is. When I had first gone to Santa Chitrama, the first monastery that I, I set foot in this lifetime, I remember picking up this Zen book, which said, when you think you've seen the Buddha, kill the Buddha. Shocking. I was like, whoa, what does this even mean? And essentially what it means is uh, not literally to kill the Buddha when you see the Buddha, um, but rather to kill that idea that we have of enlightenment, to kill all our ideas, our delusions of what this even means and constantly question our understanding of the Dhamma. And so that is very useful to have with, um, that's why we live in communities. That's why we have different roles of um, teachers and so forth. So always questioning that and that will lead to, to awakening. Okay, thank you. Of course. And Kristen asks, what is a wise way to relate to teachings from teachers who are known for misconduct? Is there truly such a thing as separating teachings from the teacher? For me, it seems easier to avoid teachers like that in the first place, since there are plenty who are ethically admirable, but more so when I witness others quote teachers with problematic conduct. <laughs> I love this question um, because actually, I did not know. Once I visited this monastery um, just for a couple of days and I picked up one of the books in the library and and read it like actually I swallowed literally, well, not literally, figuratively <laughs> the contents of the book. Like I, <laughs> I was literally so like blown away. I was like, wow, this um, it was a Japanese tradition. I'm like, wow, this Japanese monk was really enlightened. He's like so amazing, so incredible. And then, um, you know, as I was writing in the car with uh, uh, one of the, the folks of the monastery afterwards, um, they were sharing, essentially, long story short, it comes up that actually this, this monk had um, a history of like extreme bad misconduct. Um, he had died by the time I had read his book, but I was shocked. I was like, oh, wow, how could someone who, um, you know, with such an incredible understanding of the Dhamma could have done those actions. So, so there was like a big dissonance in my mind of how someone so pure and like clearly quote unquote enlightened in my mind <laughs> could actually also be this a sort of devil. And um, yeah, my reasoning was that each one of us has different karmic conditions uh, and has done different karmas and is doing different karmas that produce different vipakas. And so we can be very skillful in certain aspects of the path and really unskillful in other aspects of the path. So perhaps this this monk, you know, was really skillful in understanding maybe the the intellectual part of the of the Dhamma, or maybe he was really skillful in um, in Panya uh, and possibly also Samadhi, but a little weak on the Sila. <laughs> and you also need to develop the Sila or vice versa. You know, there can be other monastics that are uh, or practitioners who are extremely developed in Sila and very poorly developed in um, Samadhi and Panya and so forth. So what I find very skillful is to actually uh, look at it. And this was a teaching also by Ayatata Loka. She uh, emphasized that, uh, emphasizes that a lot of looking very much at what is Kuzala and Akuzala, rather than mm, going, this person is good or bad in an absolute, going this action is skillful or this action in, is unskillful. 
and understanding that yeah there's that's you know that's an acta that's a penetrate origination um so there are certain things that produce skillful results skillful actions and other things that produce unskillful results so we don't necessarily have to say that um you know throw everything out and say okay that monk was horrible and i'm gonna throw everything out of the window i mean unless in some cases actually it is maybe <laughs> the case um but we can acknowledge this you know is in accordance with Tama and this is not in accordance with Tama. This being said, if the teacher is still alive or the lineage is um is there, I completely agree with you. Um there's plenty of teachers that actually don't have these um horrible dichotomies. So yeah, if you can the more wholesome the better. Mm. The more scandalous free, scandal free the better. Mm. And so it says, Dear Venables, can I just settle on suttas being my teacher? I found that as long as I practice Brahma Viharas and read suttas and be kind to others in daily life, I'm progressing. Any thoughts? That's really wonderful that you're making progress. And I really like how you describe your practice. And I, all, I would also recommend that you keep receiving teachings. Uh, because when we retreat into our own practice, then that's when we usually start to get a little bit off track. So it's important to still receive external input and external teachings because it helps to keep, keep the Dhamma fresh in our minds. It helps to keep it from getting stale. Uh, and it helps to prevent us from uh, falling into uh, our own self-generated echo chamber. So yeah, what you're describing is a great overall strategy for practice and also continue listening to Dhamma talks from various teachers and ask questions from time to time. In the suttas, the Buddha said that the causal basis for the arising of wisdom is to periodically go to respected spiritual teachers and ask questions. So don't neglect that part of the practice. Okay. And that's the end of the questions. So I think we can go ahead and conclude at this time. Um, so thank you all for your delightful questions and we look forward to seeing you at our programs tomorrow. So we'll end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And hope to see you all soon.